Good afternoon. My name is Kathy Malloy. And as manager director of the Markham Museum, I would like to welcome you to session six of the International Online Summit, Becoming Public Art. This exciting nine week event is presented by the City of Markham in partnership with Art Plus Public Unlimited. I would like to open the proceedings with a land acknowledgement. We begin today by acknowledging that we walk upon the traditional territories of Indigenous peoples, and we recognize their history, spirituality, culture, and stewardship of the land. We are grateful to all Indigenous groups for their commitment to protect the land and its resources, and we are committed to reconciliation, partnership, and enhanced understanding. The Markham Museum is situated on a 25-acre site, lands that have been lived on and traversed by Indigenous peoples since time immemorial. As director of Markham Museum, I am committed to exploring all of our shared histories, both recent and pre-settler. I'm particularly looking forward to today's session on placemaking and public art. Now over to the co-curators of this event, Jan Wu, public art curator for the City of Markham, and Rebecca Carbon of Art Plus Public Unlimited. Thank you, Kathy, and uh, the city's videographer, Zhang Li, for preparing this uh, welcome video. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Yan Wu, public art curator for the city of Markham. Thank you all for joining us today, especially everyone returning from previous sessions. Hope you like the program we put together, we put together <laughs> and that we will see you again in the coming weeks. Mm, we've officially passed the halfway mark, three more to go. The idea of organizing this summit directly arises from the public art, uh, Markham Public Art Master Plan 2020 to 2024. When we were about to bring the plan forward to the City Council for approval, we tried to strategize on how to raise awarenesses about the potential impact of the plan, and more importantly, figure out the best practices to implement it. What are the models and how to move forward, especially for an emerging public art program like ours, still in the process of developing infrastructures and procedures. We thought, why not create an occasion to gather all the great working models in one place and study them together? Moreover, we wanted to hear everyone's voice along the production line, from artist to curator, planner to architect, designer to fabricators, creator to administrators, conservators to spectators and advocate. Um, public car making is a collective effort that demands highly complex processes and negotiations. So when the council approved our plan, we brought public art consultant Rebecca Carbon on board to design the summit together with us. It has been an absolutely wonderful experience. Thank you, Rebecca, for your knowledge insight and passion, and above all, your firm belief in public art. Originally, the summit was supposed to be a three-day in-person event back in June. Because of the COVID, we changed to an online format. It turned out that we're able to reach a global community. My sincere gratitude to those who have reached out with encouraging notes and feedback. It feels so good to know there is a community of colleagues out there who care about the same issues. Looking forward to more exchanges and discussions in the coming weeks. In parallel to the live sessions, we have also commissioned a series of interviews conducted by art writer Rosemary Heather. Yesterday, we published a three-part interview series on the topic of public art on campus, in which Rosemary and I had conversations with curators from York University, Queen's University, UFT, and UBC. The link is in the chat box. In the conversation we did with Emily Changer, former curator at uh, um, Art Gallery at York University and now direct and curator at Agnes um, Anthrington Art Center and Lisa Myers, independent curator, artist and assistant professor at York University. They talked about the commission they had been working on with Tanya Willard, today's moderator at York's um, Glendon campus and why they were attracted to Tanya's work. Also, Maria Hupfield, one of the presenters today, is mentioned in the same interview. All the interviews are available at the summit website. Um, before handing over to Rebecca to introduce today's session, I would like to say a few thank yous. Thanks to everyone at the City of Markham for making this summit happen, the amazing team at the Varley Art Gallery, and the great support from the team at Corporate Communication and IT. And most importantly, just like with our artists, there wouldn't be any public art. I want to thank all the presenters of the summit 
without you making your project happen and sharing them with us, that wouldn't be the Becoming Public Art Summit. Thank you. Now over to my collaborator, um, Rebecca Carbon. Thanks, Jan. It has also been such a pleasure to collaborate with you on pulling this program together in the various forms that it's taken over the past year that we've been working on it against a changing background. Um, it's been great to have conversations with you all along the way. Um, thanks everyone for joining us today from wherever you are. We're thrilled to be sharing today's program with you. Today in our session, Placemaking in Public Art, I'm really excited to share the work of our panelists, presentations from Marianne Barkhouse, and Native Art Department International, who are a collaborative long-term artist team of Mary Hopfield and Jason Muhan. Each presentation delves into respective artist practices from the perspective of placemaking. And we'll then have a conversation uh, between our three panelists moderated by independent curator, Tanya Willard. So a couple of housekeeping notes before I introduce our moderator for this session. Um, as with every session we've had so far, so for those of you who have joined us for multiple uh, sessions. First of all, thank you very much for doing that. Um, second of all, please bear with me while I explain to others. Um, after the moderated conversation, we will have Q&A from the audience. Please use the Q&A box, uh, bottom panel, sort of to the, to the right of the bottom panel, to input questions. And uh, I will co-facilitate with Jan feeding these to Tanya once we open the floor. We probably won't get to all questions, but we have, as I think Jan mentioned, um, been writing uh, up answers that we to questions that we don't get to and providing these with the newsletter. Public art has been recognized for decades now and uh, especially in the past 15 years as having a key role in fostering a sense of place in public, a critical agent in turning urban space into place. So much so that now commissioners, whether public or private, bestow a tremendous amount of responsibility upon public art to perform this placemaking role. It is after all the most human element of city building it brings the specifics of site and contextual narrative to the surface in a tangible and relatable way. Public art can bring to the surface conversation about intended audience and by extension, who public space is for, who is responsible for its care, past, present and future, and the philosophies behind ownership and or stewardship. In this way, our conversation about place making in place is also a conversation about land, contemporary indigeneity and relationship to land and to place. Our session today is the sixth in our nine week summit program. We're really excited about the lineup. So please join us for all or some of the following sessions. Same time and place, 1.30 uh, p.m. EST, when we cover a range of topics, always from the uh, perspective of case studies and working models. We only have three more weeks to go. I can't believe it. Um, and we will cover uh, sessions. In those sessions, we'll cover site specificity, temporary programming, and digital public art commissioning. And I think Eva has already pasted the link into the chat, but we will post it again for uh, future sessions. So without further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce our moderator today, Tanya Willard. Tanya Willard is of Sekwemek Nation and Settler Heritage. Tanya works within the shifting ideas around contemporary and traditional, often working with bodies of knowledge and skills that are conceptually linked to her interest in intersections between Aboriginal and other cultures. Willard's curatorial work includes the touring exhibition Beat Nation, Art, Hip Hop and Aboriginal Culture, uh, which toured from 2012 to 2014 and was co-curated Kat with Kathleen Ritter. In 2016, Willard received the Award for Curatorial Excellence in Contemporary Art from the Hantishan Foundation, as well as the City of Vancouver Book Award for the catalog for the ex exhibition Unceded Territories, Lawrence Paul Yuxwilupton, Willard's ongoing collaborative project, Bush Gallery, is a conceptual land-based gallery grounded in Indigenous knowledges. Willard is an associate professor at UBC Okanagan in Salix Territories, and her current research intersects with land-based art practices. She's a perfect moderator for our conversation today. Welcome, Tanya. Thank you so much. Sorry, I turned on my video a little early, um, but thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, it is my great pleasure to moderate this conversation with uh, artists that I've really admired uh, in their work and their practice for a number of years. And uh, first up for the presentations today, we have Marianne Barkhouse. And Marianne Barkhouse has strong ties to both coasts as her, as her mother is from the Nimkish band, uh, Kwakutl First Nation of Alert Bay, BC. And her father is of German and British descent from Nova Scotia. 
a descendant of a long line of internationally recognized artists, including the uh, amazing and uh, legacy um, setting Ellen Neal, Mungo Martin, and Charlie James. She graduated with honors from the Ontario College of Art and has exhibited widely in Canada and the United States. Her work is in major collections across Canada. Response to landscape is at the core of Marianne Barkhouse's work, engaging with multiple layers of history and disrupting the anthropocentric gaze. Her installations offer vignettes through which we can view the environments that gave rise to indigenous cultures. While depiction of the human is not included in her sculptures, it is inferred through the interpretation of the species she portrays and their placement, and gives rise to questions surrounding occupation, land, authority, and possible futures. And so we're so happy uh, to have Marianne uh, speak about her work. Thank you, Marianne. Oh, thank you, Tanya. And uh, thank you, um, thank you to everyone uh, like uh, for inviting me to be a part of this discussion. I look forward to uh, to the discussion that follows uh, afterwards. And I'll just start uh, start my screen. Hopefully, uh, hopefully that's being shared. Um, so I, uh, I think I wanted to, to kick off um, part of my uh, presentation uh, just to give a bit of background uh, about, my, um, about myself and how that further informs uh, the artworks that I've been putting across the country. Um, so, uh, oh, sorry, I'm, now it's not, oh, there we go. Uh, so there we go. Okay, so as uh, Tanya mentioned, um, uh, I come from a family of notable Northwest Coast carvers. So a lot of the people that were on my mother's side of the family um, have been artists as well as fishermen for uh, probably back to the dawn of time. So when we're talking about things like um, indigenous um, placemaking markers and monuments, I think in a lot of people's minds, one of the first things that would um, spring to mind would be things like the, uh, the poles, totem poles and house posts and things like that, that one would see on the Northwest coast. So this is um, just a picture of my great, great grandfather, Charlie James. And he taught a lot of the um, other people in my family uh, about carving. Uh, so uh, uh, this, such as Mungo Martin, um, who was his stepson. And then my mother's aunt, Ellen Neal. Um, so from them, I had, I developed an appreciation of why, uh, the different purposes for artwork, I suppose, the, um, and, the, and how some of them are, are very personal, some of them are for the community and, Although I personally don't carve in the same fashion or make artwork in the same fashion that my family has done, I think that the continuity that I find for marking place and, and um, marking our time in, in the universe is just through the different stories that I try to tell um, uh, through my artworks. So uh, as you saw in the previous picture, um, my, uh, with with Ellen, actually, maybe I should go back to the previous picture. No, that's now I'm going to. There we go. Um, I I had the sensibility of things that are made again, as I mentioned, for different purposes. So there is the small um, to, uh, small tourist totem poles that my aunt used to make, but then she also did these really large commissions um, that would be that were to go all over the world. So in following along that sort of idea, um, I have done smaller works uh, in silversmithing, uh, working with a variety of precious metals, telling stories that are from my family. So for example, this, these are pieces that are in the collection of the UBC Museum of Anthropology. And it illust they illustrate the time that my grandfather, who was a salmon fisherman, um, and part of the Native Brotherhood out uh, on the coast of BC, caught, as, as you see, caught, he caught a whale in his net. Uh, and how he, and there's a whole long story, which I won't go into it, except to say that he, he did release the whale from the net, even though SeaWorld wanted to keep him, uh, wanted him to keep the whale so that they could have it. 
Uh, but it's, this is just uh, one small example of how I try and embed um, sometimes literally stories from my family or sometimes it's the sensibility that I have got from these stories. Um, so this is, uh, I, I also, I guess from when I'm discussing my uh, artwork, I wanted to illustrate it through a couple of case studies of pieces that I've done over the past decade. So some of them reference human cultural history. Uh, some of them focus on natural history and one of them will focuses on more like indigenous philosophy. So this was a piece, it's called, it's titled Quarry that I did about five years ago for the city of Markham. It's located close to the Varley Art Gallery uh, overlooking Two Good Pond. And for this particular piece, I was looking at juxtaposing the history of that area, the natural history, um, also with the, um, the settler settlement history. Uh, so to do that, I went back to some of the, some of the, there was German and there was also French people who had colonized that area from before. So this is one of, of course, one of Louis the 14th's favorite hounds. So what, and um, then you can see some of the, uh, how that's the influences of those types of dogs. Um, but I'll go back to the piece, first of all, just to talk about it. So for the formation of the rocks, I was uh, influenced by places like the gardens that you find over in Europe. And then mashing that up with the intervention of the indigenous, um, where there's, you can't quite see it, but there's a little squirrel on top of that uh, erratic boulder. So this erratic boulder is in place of where there would otherwise be a very formal piece. And then all the dogs that are part of the, um, part of the installation uh, are all dogs that the aristocracy um, would have had several hundred years ago in Europe because there are certain types of dogs that only the aristocracy, uh, aristocracy sorry, I'm having problems with my words, um, were allowed to uh, own. So those were diff different types of hunting dogs. So for my, I chose a sight hound, um, a scent hound, and a go to ground dog. So this is the, uh, the scent hound modeled after one of Louis XIV's dogs. Um, this is a sight hound uh, type of dog that would have been uh, owned by some of the, um, the, actually the Russian aristocracy. And then you can see there's a little terrier in there, a go to ground dog. So this is, um, when I was researching the history of Markham, I saw that there was a lot of French aristocracy that were actually fleeing the French Revolution that came to that area of Canada for some time. Um, but then they made it through one winter and they decided to go back to France, which I thought was a little amusing that they would decide to, they would rather face, possibly face the guillotine than go through another Canadian winter. Uh, and this is just some of the uh, images of the gardens that that stonework is modeled after. Uh, so this is a garden at Vola Vicomte uh, in France. And just to give you a little bit of an idea of um, how one goes about making these types of things, a lot of mat, there's a lot of behind the scenes, of course, a lot of um, large crane trucks and cement involved in making public artwork often. Um, so this was just an example of one, um, one piece that, that I had used, you know, and there's the public interacting with the public artwork. Um, but I'm very conscious um, when I'm making uh, artwork um, of, of how, it's, how it will insert itself into other people's lives, into other people's histories. And I'm, although I'm, sh I'm sure that a lot of people won't get all of the information that I embed into the pieces, that hopefully they'll come away um, questioning uh, why it's there, what the different components are, why are those different components together, and there's uh, life imitating art. Um, I, I've owned Jack Russell Terriers and several of my friends have Jack Russell Terriers, so there's one right there. Um, this is a piece that I did that's referencing uh, more natural history. This is a recent piece that was done couple of years ago for, it used to be Queen Elizabeth uh, Park, now it's River Lot 11, the Indigenous Art Park in Edmonton. So for this, I was going back before the um, pre-1900s, 
prehistory, I guess, pre-humanity period, um, because there was all the different waves of um, indigenous peoples, but also the settler peoples that came through there. So I wanted to have a look at what was there beforehand um, and look at the different cycles of that play itself over millions of years. So for some of the images on that pillar that the coyote, uh, so there's coyote, a bronze coyote sitting on top of a granite pillar that's engraved with images of uh, different types of dinosaurs that have been found directly in that valley. So this was an Albertosaurus. Um, there's a hadrosaur, Edmontosaurus, I believe it was called, uh, trilobite. Um, I'm tr also trying to look at the predator-prey um, cycles that go on, whether it's uh, small little fish or crustaceans, or whether they're larger reptiles. And then in the back there is uh, a hare lounging behind the, the coyote. And on the um, engraved into the granite stone uh, pavers are different plants that are important not only to the animals but are more uh, also to the indigenous people that have lived there for thousands and thousands of years since the glaciers receded. So I like when I'm doing things like this. I like to look at the different layers of history that have given rise to the different types of habitation that have been in that area. Um, and where we have, uh, where the different plant, uh, where the different type species, whether it's uh, hares, uh, coyotes, or people, um, where we go to to maintain our health, our different kinds of medicines, how do we sustain ourselves going forward? Uh, this is a piece again, looking kind of juxtaposing natural history along with human history. Um, it's a piece that's titled Set, uh, Settlement. It's at um, Rodman Hall in St. Catharines. And um, it was done around the time of the anniversary, uh, 200, 200th anniversary of the War of 1812. So for that, that time, I was looking at um, the, uh, the the alliances that were coming together at that point and unlikely alliances between the indigenous people and the different European uh, cultures that were coming over. Um, so, of course, me being me, I, uh, I, I looked at the unlikely alliance of between badgers and coyotes. And then I placed them within the perimeter, uh, a garden, so you can see in this image, um, just beyond the little bronze, the, not little, but life-size bronze characters, the, the footprint of the garden that is starting to be going in. So this was the footprint of um, the smallest, uh, the, the house that the settlers had to make. If they wanted to get a free land grant in that area, they had to agree to um, create a house that was about 16 by 26 feet in, um, in measurement and uh, also to clear five acres of land per year. So this was part of how the, the British were trying to get that area settled so that they could uh, feel good about laying claim to the area. Uh, so within that garden, I planted plants, um, plants and animals that were domesticated, oh, not animals, <laughs> plants, sorry, uh, that were domesticated and traded among the indigenous people of the Americas. So this included things like uh, corn, beans, squash, but also quinoa. Um, so the quinoa was uh, to create the walls of the, of the house, and then the corn, bean, and squash formed the pillars at the four corners of the house. So this is uh, the piece. Um, a couple of uh, later on in the season when the quinoa is starting to grow. And there's a close up of the badger. But um, yeah, so this is uh, again looking at different issues around, uh, I guess, human history, a certain point of human history, and sort of using that as a jumping off point to. Um, contemplate about where we are as a re result of these alliances years later. And then, because many people said, why a badger and a coyote? Well, I've, I had learned that years ago that uh, badgers and coyotes 
will sometimes hunt cooperatively. And this apparently was not believed by many people um, for years and years and years. And then it was found, it was documented. People said, oh, it's just an old, old tale that the Indians say. And it's, uh, that, that, but they, they, they were talking about it. And actually it was First Nation said, yes, we've known this has gone on for all time. And I think it was um, probably about three decades ago that um, some people from, uh, students from UCLA actually documented the coyotes and uh, badgers hunting together. So now it's, it's a known thing. Of course, the coyotes seem to benefit more because the badgers go down and they dig out the gophers and then there's not one but two coyotes waiting for the badger to finish working. Uh, kind of like a work crew. And this is a more recent uh, documentation of a coyote and badger hanging out together that was uh, done earlier this year. So I urge you to look, look for it in Twitter. It's hilarious how they uh, cooperate together. Um, so to kind of bring it, uh, wrap it up with um, uh, going to a story that my grandfather, uh, who you saw briefly earlier in the situation and about the same grandfather that had caught the whale in the net. He had told me a, a story uh, about, um, about helping a wolf uh, uh, cross a, a stretch of water um, out on the west coast and actually when he, when he did it, it was in a skiff. It wouldn't have been in a large traditional canoe but he, a wolf was trying to get across uh, a stretch of water between the mainland and some of the islands and there was a lot of sort of like ripped like whirlpool kind of thing so he helped the wolf get from point a to point b and then there's more to the story but i'll just focus on that that episode so i was thinking about how the the philosophy that under underpinned that as far as having uh, the idea of latitude of thought and compassion for other things. And so when I was approached to do uh, a commission for the Museum of Civilization, uh, which is in Gatineau, uh, I thought, oh, this is a gift because if there's any place to situate this particular piece that I had in my mind that I would like to make uh, do. So the piece is called um, Namatsala, uh, which means in Kwakwala, it means to travel in a boat together. Um, I'll just go back one for a moment. Um, if there's ever a place to think about, have the ideas of latitude of thought and compassion for other, uh, for other living things, it's right across from Parliament Hill in Canada. So I thank um, Leanne Martin for uh, asking me for that. She was a curator at the uh, museum at that time for approaching me to do this and then also to agree for the placement of this particular piece. Um, so I've, I wanted to show through, through those couple of, uh, those few examples of work that I've done, um, just some of the different approaches and the ideas that I think are important when, when I go to place um, an artwork in a public space. I take that responsibility very seriously. Um, I like it to have relevance to the location. I like it to be respectful to the communities that are there, but I also like to have it informed with some of the, the teachings that I've had from my family, um, from both sides of my family. Actually, part, part of my family is from um, British Columbia and I'm originally from British Columbia, but part of my family is from the other coast. Um, in Nova Scotia, and they were a farming family that had come over from Germany like in 1752. So they've been here uh, hundreds of years. And from both sides of the family, I've had an appreciation for stewardship of land and water and what it takes to um, survive, I guess, uh, or uh, survive and what's important for our communities um, as well as ourselves. Uh, and how we function to help that to the help help our communities and i'm um to look forward but also to ground it in the ideas of of the indigenous people of who were there to begin with and to pay respect to that and then to lay maybe have this jumping off point of where do we go from there um so maybe i'll just leave it at that for the moment i don't know if there you would like to if tanya would like to jump in at this point and say that I forgot something. <laughs> no, that's fantastic. Thank you, Marianne. Um, okay, and I'm not sure how to 
maybe I should, should I stop sharing my screen at this moment? Stop sharing your screen. Okay, I'll stop the share. Perfect. Thank and you so much for that presentation, Marianne. Okay. Uh, and following uh, Marianne's presentation, um, we are going to be joined by Native Art Department International. And uh, Native Art Department International is the collaborative long-term project of uh, Maria Hupfield and Jason Luhan. It focuses on communications platforms and art world systems of support, while at the same time functioning as an emancipation from essentialism and identity-based artwork. It seeks to circumvent easy categorization of, by comprising curated exhibitions, video screenings, panel talks, collective art making, and an online presence. However, all activities contain an undercurrent of positive progress through cooperation and non-competition. When Maria and Jason created Native Art Department International in 2016, neither of them could have predicted the dramatic course of global events that would follow. We are now in an art world that reflects the broader debates regarding who is allowed to have presence and who is not, who is allowed to have shared experiences and who is not. In this context, the concerns of artists invested in creating spaces for being, seeing, speaking, and listening is of urgent importance. In this presentation, Maria and Jason, who I've also had uh, um, the, the lucky uh, um, happenstance of knowing for a long time and having worked with Maria, in the past. Uh, in this presentation, they're going to talk about uh, pr their proposed double gazebo project, which um, I understand was commissioned to be unveiled at the original in-person iteration of Becoming Public Art. Uh, and it's a, as a structure, the double gazebo um, is created to invite public involvement, uh, the interruption of this project and its eventual reintroduction into a changed public environment is something they'll share with us in their presentation. So thank you, Maria and Jason. I hand it over to you. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for coming. Um, we've decided what Maria and I often do well is we complement each other. Um, we're actually in two separate locations. And so we'll, we'll pursue this presentation as a, uh, as a conversation mostly, but I have control of the PowerPoint. Um, so Maria, you'll need to cue me and I'll just get us started. Are, are you ready? I'm ready. Yeah. Great. All right. So let's get this thing going. Um, we are Native Art Department. Ooh, what happened? There we are. We are Native Art Department. Um, we're both individual artists. Uh, Maria, why don't you why don't you tell some give us a little bit of background on um, what we've been up to, how we got started, um, and then I'll I'll start going in further into this particular project if you like. Sure. So Jason and I are also married. We're a couple. Um, and we, um, early in our relationship, we shared a studio space together. And we found that we, as artists often do, that we were um, talking about so many things together. And we reached a point where we realized we really wanted to work together. So that kind of um, is where we started. Uh, initially, we tried a different, uh, a different name. We, we called ourselves our um, RTST, which stood for Raiding the Same Territory, and we wanted to be anonymous. So basically as a way to kind of say things, do things that we couldn't normally do in our own art practice. Well, soon enough people caught wind and they're like, well, we want, they, they wanted to include our names. So they wanted to say Maria Hutfield, Jason Lujan, RTST, and that defeated the whole purpose. So we ended up abandoning that project and moving on. And and then we came to this particular one. Um, you know, it's really, we're from two very different places. Jason's from the desert where there's no water. Um, he finds trees to be really alien. And I'm from the Great Lakes region where there's tons of water, many, many trees. So we found that the city is one place where we could both um, be on a common ground and on equal footing, so to speak, as two different, as coming from two different indigenous backgrounds and also um, with other ancestry as well in there. Great, so I'll move on. Um, so before we begin our presentation, I wanna bring our attention to two um, organizations located in Canada and Toronto. I think we need to use this opportunity as members of this community to, I just wanna bring your attention to Black Health Alliance Canada and the Native Youth Sexual Health Network located in Toronto. 
Uh, if you're looking for uh, outreach, if you're feeling, um, you know, these are tough times with this pandemic, it's affected um, Black, Indigenous, people of color in a completely disproportionate um, way, uh, please uh, reach out to these guys. This is now part of this presentation. There are the links, there's a short information. Um, thank you so much for your patience while we uh, do this. I just wanted to pair some sort of action to the territorial acknowledgement that we had from the Varley earlier. Um, so now let's go on. So speaking of the Varley, uh, originally in early winter of this year, we were approached and asked to do a proposal for a temporary outdoor um, structure and on the theme of public art and what it meant to be public and turning, um, trying to the dialogue of public art, particularly in an environment that is probably not used to it. And this is just, this is not a very becoming photo of the Varley Courtyard. It's, this photo shows it being um, under construction of having uh, pavers put into the courtyard. But this is the area we were asked. Um, they asked, they gave us a lot of options, but Maria and I settled on this courtyard area because we found it to be a very challenging environment. Um, most of the time when people come to the Varley, they park in one or two parking lots and then enter the museum from one of these two covered walkways, completely bypassing this courtyard. Um, we understood that this courtyard was, the, the community around this courtyard was um, not used to public art. And so we wanted to use this as an opportunity to uh, think in terms of a more holistic environment of what we could contribute so that way um, the public could have the opportunity to immerse themselves and understand uh, cultural significance of the GTA and indigenous culture as well, and artists and see artists as a community asset. Uh, so we, we went home and Maria started making sketches. And Maria, um, I'll just let you walk us through these sketches. Okay, yes. Yeah. So uh, one of the things about our process when we work together is we set aside time to have a meeting and we'll often um, be in conversation thinking through ideas. And at the same time, if there's a piece of paper around, I'll begin to sketch things out. So that's what we're looking at here. It's um, a really process-based, as we're talking, um, visualizing and imagining, which is um, something I tend to do a lot of in my own work. So here we're... Oh, I don't know if I froze or Maria froze. I think Maria froze. Yeah. Okay, so I'll carry on while she hopefully, so, so I'll show you, we, Maria had an idea where we wanted to do something that was rather low profile because this space was considered somewhat compromised. Um, and Maria started making sketches and she says, Jason, you know, what I really want to do is create platforms, um, low level platforms that are not, um, we, we wanted to veer away from something that was monumental and we both share that aesthetic. And I'm really hoping Maria I hope someone's sending Maria a message because she really wanted to talk about her concepts of platforms. And I really yeah, I don't I sent her a text message letting her know we're a partnership and I don't want to do this alone. Um, so uh, we had these low profile, these low profile platforms uh, that we would either make a few of and rather than make a single like stage, we didn't want to make a stage. We wanted to make several of varying sizes and of different types that would allow um, people to elevate themselves temporarily, but also create passage. And that's what you're looking at here. You have like the split uh, circle here, and then you have, of course, what it looks like two U-shaped, like a, like a split donut. Um, and we felt that this kind of thing, hey, you're back. And we felt that this kind of thing would enliven the atmosphere there, but in a way that rewards careful viewing. I just moved on to the sketch and told him about the platforms and I'm gonna move on to the next image and you can talk about that, okay? Great, thank you. Thanks for coming back. All right, and this is here. Yeah, I had to move spaces, sorry for that. Unreliable internet times these days. Um, yeah, keep me posted if I cut out again. So what we're looking at now are just um, some more crazy sketches of mine. We're beginning to think of adding a top um, you can see the beginning of what looks like so that some aerial views um, looking down at a structure, a dome structure. You're also seeing 
what I see as like, I can recognize it. I don't know if anyone else will, but a flower motif, um, starting to think about working with different, um, responding to natural environments, thinking about plants, vegetation, kinship connections that have to do with the land, place, um, looking at what's around in that area. There's also a little, it looks like a bowl. Um, I'm trying to remember now what was on my mind for that, but I have absolutely a connection with like dome structures, thinking of sky dome, thinking of water basins, thinking of now that we're um, here in Toronto, um, thinking of things like the dish with one spoon, all kinds of connections and just getting all of that down. Yeah, so um, at a certain point, we were kind of on board to do staging. And then I think Maria, you were like, you know what? I kind of want to have a shelter. We can do a shelter component to it because that seems that courtyard is so exposed. The trees didn't provide any cover and we decided just to kind of go with it. So the next couple of images are just going to are images from our personal practices that will probably help inform some of our later design elements. Um, so Maria, I'll let you take it from here. Just walk me through these and let me know when you want me to keep going. Yeah, I remember going there and seeing how hot it was, right, and thinking about how youth would, um, young people would go and play in that area and just really wanting to give them a, a bit of um, shelter. So what you're looking at here is just a bench that I did as an outdoor commission for Montreal. It's called Zigzag. It's a lightning bolt. You can show the next one, Jason. So um, I call these social sculptures. So really creating a space for people to gather, um, sit ideally amongst you know, outdoors. This is a piece called Kapow that's in the middle of a gallery, um, shifting and, and, and problematizing about what that means when it changes into an indoor space, um, how it's utilized. So these are things we're already beginning to think about um, structures for bodies, um, for people, places to gather, Next one. So this one coming up is where we talk about, we had decided that we wanted to have particular design elements um, in the stage, in, in the original, in the staging, and then later in, in something with a, sh with a shelter component. And you have a history of using um, plant relief. So I'll let you, I'll turn it back over. Yeah, so this is uh, some early work that I did. So you're looking at a lino cut um, that's called the hoop of her skirt, which is really this idea of the memory of hiding in my mother's skirt. So if I imagine that her skirt would make a circle on the ground, that is the space that she would occupy. Um, and then the other one on the left is a routered piece of plywood, again with a floral motif. So we're seeing um, strawberry plants, um, some rose hips, all kinds of other vegetation. Um, and again, connecting to floral motifs I'd seen, and in this case, really struggling um, this battle between using a machine and wood um, and trying to um, think about that balance between nature and, um, you know, industry as well. And then this piece is all places, all times, always and forever. And so you can see a, a felt version, which I hand cutted, kind of poking out of the the side there. I also use a lot of different reflective surfaces. So when I'm not working with industrial felt, which is the material I primarily work with these days, um, in the hot summer months, I often work with shiny reflective material and fabrics um, as a mirrored surface. Yeah, so I think when we were looking at making, if you look back at the sketches, we have the donut shapes or we have the round sets. There's definitely this kind of visuality that's in, that would be easily easy to carry over into that. But what's funny is that we just looked at a series of your work where you're looking at the land and coming from a desert environment, um, I have a different uh, focus and themes in, in terms of the natural uh, focus. And so I originally, I've always done a lot of work with transparency uh, using spray paint and gold, prepared gold leaf on transparencies. And as Maria was talking about laying in um, images of vegetation and things like that. I was thinking of cosmic imagery. And so that was a pretty good marriage to try to put together um, with these platforms or with whatever sculptural elements that we were gonna add. We would have, um, uh, what's the word, I guess, countersunk 
reflective material that would have both vegetation and cosmic uh, imagery. And these are images from some installations I did in New York City where I got some industrial plastic and then put some 24 karat gold leaf four pointed stars, which are um, native peoples across the continent are, are very, very different, but there are some commonalities among them, um, respect for the land and being land defenders, but also in terms of some of their visualities and the way we represented the cosmos. Um, so I would go around and the idea, what I was thinking of it was that when we look up through the stars and we see the rest of the creation, we're looking through these stars um, to see the other side. So it would be interesting to recreate these stars on plastic and wrap existing artwork with them so that these artworks had to look through this native cosmology to see us. And that's what these works are from. So um, Marie and I both work with reflective materials and it, those kinds of things carry over into our um, native art department international practice. Uh, there's also one where I did a silk screen of a Pawnee star map on translucent material and did several versions of it. So it's a very similar thing. You can see what's behind and you can see the frame. So what we wanted to do was we would make these platforms um, have cosmic elements to it and then natural elements to it. And then somewhere along the way, Maria said, you know, I forget what, what it was. We were, having, we were having some problems and I think we felt like we were making too many compromises because there were, there were some barriers being set up, a lot of unknown unknowns. Um, and then you said, you know what, let's, let's do a gazebo. And I think we were like, we were both like sitting in our kitchen, getting ready to have dinner. And I think you came up with the idea. Remember, we were getting ready to tuck into a bowl of something. And you're like, how about a gazebo? And I thought that was a really nice idea. And so here we have a picture of just a prefab gazebo. And as Maria and I talked, we figured one of the best things, that one of the best ways is rather than reinvent the wheel, there were a lot of prefab gazebos and we could just rework a prefab gazebo. And then, you can stop me anytime, Maria, because I'm just going to keep going. Because this is—I um, just is... remember if that's the way it happened. I mean, I love me a good gazebo, uh, and the idea of it being doubling as a stage. And thinking about a space for musicians. Um, yeah. I also think about elders having, you know, a, that they always require a space for shade. All of those things, um, but also my dream is to have like a yard with a gazebo anyway. So that might have been definitely on my my list. I think also we were talking about there was this there was a story or an anecdote we had heard somewhere how the barley had added a purple sign to the museum and how the citizenry reacted poorly. So we felt we needed something that would be familiar to a certain extent. And the, you're like, hey, who hates a gazebo, right? It's like hating a baby seal. You can't do it. Um, and then as we kept going, we figured, well, why don't have two? Because there's two of us. And this is just a general rendering of a gazebo. And this is kind of where we've arrived. Um, we would get a gazebo, two, we would get a prefab gazebo and then have it re-engineered so that it intersected with another prefab gazebo. Um, and then you went through and you're like, and you know, one of the interesting things is the way it intersects. So it's not about combining two structures or connecting them. It's about having them intersect so that they're both, you know, you, if you destroy one, you destroy the other. And I think um, that there's a lot of metaphor in there in, in terms of just the way we live and as people yeah. and those kinds of things. So I'll run through another image. Um, so this is just a rendering, just a general sketch. I think you and I had some aesthetic, we, we don't like this kind of gazebo. There's just there's too much going on. It's, there's a lot of like, you know, lace and stuff on here. The, the shingles are bad. Um, the couple of us, we didn't like. It was a little too folksy. Yeah, so we went to different versions and we went through just through a bunch. Um, and here's just a CGI rendering. And then here's another CGI rendering of it, but this time where the fencing, the gating, makes it a little more complicated to negotiate that space. And then remind me of what's going on up here. Right, so we wanted to, we started to think about what, what we could, um, how we could alter the structure a little bit to make it, um, to give it our own kind of signature. <laughs> and so we thought about this mirrored surface as a way to mirror the sky, um, that it could be kind of a chameleon or a camouflage. Um, 
and that there'd be a balance between what, I mean, so much about it is about reciprocity and balance. So between the cosmos and then the earth and then us in between, almost if I think of even like a Anishinaabe hand, finger twined bag, you know, that the outside is both, um, you know, the stuff of sky world, the stuff of water world, and the stuff that goes in the pouch is the stuff of people. So I, you know, we're kind of bringing these ideas into this work. Um, one of the things I really like about our each of our projects is that we we like to we we like to use something that's relatable, something that's everyday that people recognize, so that there's some there's a way that we can become accessible, and our ideas resist the tendency to to be positioned as the exotic. But yet here we have these kind of like futuristic um, gazebos that could be spaceships, that could be, you know, mirrored surfaces, um, water, you know, I think of water when I see the shiny surfaces as well, that reminds me of the surface of Georgian Bay, you know, on a sunny day. Um, so we're looking at applying different mirrored surfaces to, um, you can see it on the, the, the sides, the strips on the sides, and then the top. And, you know, we're, we're thinking of different treatments around that. And of course, we're, you know, beginning to, um, beginning that process, and we'll see where that lands. Yeah, I think one of the things we talked about was how from a distance, it would kind of shimmer. And it, because it's the outside of the roof, it would reflect the sky. Um, and then thus, it would be kind of I, I, you kind of meant you kind of said all that stuff already, but you know we would have this immersive experience where people could enter the space um, and understand its its structure, but how it's it's twinning and it's about and it's inviting people to have um, to immerse themselves into this experience and have shared experiences under one roof, under two roofs acting as one roof, but that it would reflect the outside and and on those during the spring or summer if, when those trees were there, it would reflect the trees as well, as well as the sky and the clouds. Um, but then, then we had COVID hit and there were these, a lot of, you know, we, we began to enter into this, I remember early in March, we were, we were, I was meeting with fabricators and contractors to start getting this thing going when uh, Canada started to shut down. And it became very dangerous to be in proximity with people you didn't know or to even breathe the same air. Um, and so we, we're actually at a point now where the reason this is still in proposal stages, because I think Maria, we probably are gonna wanna go back and rethink some of this because it, it can be dangerous to be, you know, there was a time where if we were walking down the street and we saw someone walking in the same direction, one of us would cross the street. Do you remember those days? Um, and I still think we're kind of there uh, but we still like this. Oh, and then in terms of cosmology, I think we were trying to integrate some sort of the, or, and plant. We would integrate that in the interior of the roof structure, that you would walk in and you would see it reflected at you. Um, you would see yourself in the reflection of these elements as opposed to looking at them, right? right. Yeah, so that we would, um, both on the, the surface that you're walking and then the surface that you would look up and see. Yeah. Um, do me, a, please do me a favor. You're so much better at I am at this. Can you talk a little bit about, cause we have some time. Um, what were we talking about well, now that COVID's hit and we're, we're finding ourselves at this crisis where inviting people to gather is not, not necessarily a good thing, especially if they're people who don't know each other. And we want to think about the holistic environment, um, enlivening an atmosphere, but also a, a holistic environment situation. Um, what are we thinking with this? Oops. Yeah. I, um, well, there is an image where you showed the, the rails, and I think that that is more along the lines of what we're looking at, where it kind of um, guides a movement through the structure. So in terms of things like perhaps having ramps, stairs, an entrance and exit, signage, all of those are aesthetic choices that we're, you know, really looking into. I mean, a gazebo outdoors is a pretty safe place during COVID. Also, whether or not the museum is open, it can still function. It can still be a site and active and useful um, structure for the public. 
you know, as a destination, as a place to go do things. Um, I think mostly what we kind of hit up against was that ultimately, you know, because I'm a performance artist, that we imagined this kind of extensive programming that could happen, you know, with different people who we knew in the city who could come in and activate this at different times. And now we're rethinking a lot of that because so much has moved over to Zoom, what that could look like. Although I don't know that that's still impossible. I think it's still um, really feasible to have something that could be contained, um, shot on site, and then broadcast, you know, we're moving more in other directions now on Zoom, people are pre-recording panels, all of that. So there's still, there's still options on how that can happen. And it, it still feels like early days right now because of, you know, as we're experiencing the second wave, um, is, well, things can change and I guess we'll have to see where we land in a couple of months with. Yeah with everything, with the pandemic. Yeah, I think so too. I think one of the weird things is that as we're being, as we're being, um, as, as gathering is being proscribed, uh, we're actually losing public space more and more as this year's, we, there's actually less public space this year than there was at the beginning of the year, even though, um, and I think it's, it's important to create spaces where people can just show up and they're invited and they have they can just be and think. And the reason we had the reflections here, I think we wanted to have these reflective elements on these posts is so that um, people are reminded that as, as people, we occupy space, we breathe air, we're part of this earth. Um, we move amongst it, we move amongst everything. Uh, and we're not, um, um, we're not singular. And that's why we use reflective services. You use it really well, but we've also used it in other projects where um, to remind people of, you know, when you look, or maybe you'll see another person in a reflection, or you're not, you're not by yourself, and, and those kinds of elements. Um, hmm, okay. I, get, I think we're at the end of our PowerPoint, and I think we've covered a few things, so, yeah. Well, absolutely, as Native Art Department International, we're always moving and resisting this idea of a hierarchical model and really wanting to um, open things up. So I think the gazebo also points to that as well. Mm. Thank you so much, Maria and Jason. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to start my video here. Thank you so much for that presentation and to hear a bit about that project and the, um, the ways in which you've kind of positioned it to rethink it. Um, we have a few minutes now for a bit of a conversation. I'm just gonna reflect a bit of what I heard through both of your presentations and pose a question that I hope that um, both yourselves and Marianne um, will get a chance to respond to. And then following that, we are opening up also with some moderated questions and answers from the chat. So if people want to send those in, um, Rebecca will send some to me to read out. But firstly, uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm thinking about both of your presentations uh, when I had a chance to, to speak with you all earlier. And I, I also know, um, you know, and I've seen and experienced a number of works by all of you uh, in the past. And so I'm, I'm thinking about this in context with your presentations as well. And about the kind of uh, uh, themes of this panel in terms of placemaking. But I'm, I'm interested in this way, Marianne, that you talked about um, decentering the anthropocentric, and I might also call it the settlerocentric, um, you know, and thinking about decentering that um, space and that gaze. Uh, in, Mary, in Marianne's work, I think about it in terms of not depicting the human, um, that instead we're, we see these four legged sculptural forms. Or, and then also the void of the individual figure. Um, that's occupied instead by collaborative and socially engaged kind of spaces, Maria and Jason, and especially thinking about the previous ways in which you were thinking about activating that space through performance, through happenings, uh, and the care involved in thinking about um, the work as something that could also provide shelter, um, you know, thinking about different um, demographics in terms of young people and elders. So in thinking of all that, I'm thinking of that as a kind of, um, Maybe there's a sense of uh, how Leon Simpson refers to Jarrett Martineau's idea of generative refusal or affirmative refusal, that it's, it's refusing to be one thing, but in, a, in this way it's generating all these other potentialities. And so I'm thinking, um, uh, what possibilities does that horizontality allow for? 
and and just building on that and and in terms of you saying like non-hierarchical structures, um, Maria and Jason, does that horizon, that horizontality of decentering, maybe the Western art figure, the monument, uh, those kinds of ready um, jumps in thinking about public art, does that also destabilize other conventions of public art? And I, I wrote it out for you in the chat and I'm happy to reiterate so <laughs> that's a long question, but uh, your presentations both uh, had me thinking a lot about those things. And uh, sorry, whoever wants to oh. jump in first on that. <laughs> sorry, I was waiting to, uh, I didn't want to just jump in and go, okay, I'll do that. Um, but I think that uh, it's, it's really, uh, at least I can, uh, I'll speak from my, from my own, um, I guess, experience with that. I think it's really important to do that decentering and repositioning that gaze because there is so much, or has been until recent, fairly recently, um, so much of a different mindset within the public realm as far as what people would normally be encountering uh, in their day to day, um, probably right across the country from my experience. So. I deliberately, at least with my pieces, I deliberately try and take a different tact because you know there's all these all these things all across the country that, um, in the case of public art, often uh, celebrate, I guess, uh, colonial authority in one way or another, or colonial history and things like that. So I'm trying to bring it back literally to a very, uh, I, I I think a very basic point as far as our own our own nature, our, our own ecologies that we, we live with and how to reset something so that people can approach something and it's not some guy on a pedestal. Like in my, I guess in one case, my, my, the, the piece that I did in Edmonton was a, a bit more of a direct response to that. So instead of some guy on a pedestal that had won a war or had been part of a legislature from hundreds of years ago, I've got a coyote. I think of survivors and I think of, um, often I use coyotes uh, uh, for, for the history that they have because in the past 500 years, the population of coyotes has exploded because, and there's been no animal that um, a lot of the settlers had originally tried to kill more than a coyote. So that's why I'm, I'm thinking of these ideas like down in the States, the ideas around manifest destiny and da da da. And for me, it's, a, uh, it's drawing upon these characters. It's a symbol of, of this, res not just a quiet resistance, but a resistance that, that um, of how we can persevere in different ways. Uh, I don't know if that's entirely clear by, by some of the, uh, the ways that I explain it, but I try to do that through the positioning of of the different characters or the different aspects of my, uh, um, I guess my my installations, or maybe it's just like coyote worship. Who knows? I'm there with the coyote worship. <laughs> also, <laughs> um, Maria and uh, and or Jason, did you want to um, respond to that in thinking about your work and thinking about that kind of decentering? I mean, in your work, you know, I think you it, it really speaks to the ways in which you've kind of um, Thought about this other space like there's these two entries into the gallery and you've thought about this more kind of disused space um, and activating it yeah maria do you want me to start great you're okay so one of the things that we're, we're often um, we engage in when we undertake a project is uh, native self-determination uh, by exercising our freedom of expression and our freedom of creativity we're not interested in being reactive politically or circumstantially or being forced to be reactive, um, which I think there is a huge expectation, especially among Native artists, to operate in that way. And a lot of artists have had, made a very good living operating that way, but we prefer to have, not be creatively constrained in that way. Um, so when we saw this, we are also really into creating work that can appear to be authorless. So when you look at something, you may see various elements or ingredients that are part of our individual practices, but there's no real knowing. And you know, you, you, a gazebo is a really good example. As for some of our earlier projects, where it um, it it's authorless. The process is actually a big part of the artwork. The collaboration that Maria and I are doing together 
is actually the most important component, more important than the actual results. And I feel that's a very, um, you know, most of the time when you think about indigenous knowledge, you think of Western frameworks being put over other knowledge systems, but it's still very uh, judgment driven into the final outcome. And for us, that's, it's actually not about that. Uh, Maria, do, can I turn it over to you? Sure. I mean, I guess also as visual artists and be, vis you know, having our own visual vocabulary as well, that we, of course, do think of the final product in that it, we want a good experience. So there's that as well. Um, but yeah, otherwise, I really love hearing everyone talk. Um, Marianne, Jason, Jason's um, one of his ambition is to have a, a dog ranch one day. So we <laughs> love all of these four-legged creatures. Um, sorry, Jason. Tell him. I would, I would tell love him. to come and visit that dog ranch. <laughs> um, well, anyway, so I think that's that's our answer. Is we're just trying to escape these kinds of essentialist readings in mm -hmm. the output and the creation creation of our artworks. Yeah. Yeah, and I think um, uh, both of you, Marianne, you talked about um, the piece at the Museum of Civilization and the way that uh, it's placed in water and that kind of reflection mm -hmm. and your use of reflective materials, Jason and Maria, I think points to this kind of, um, this, this essentialism can be really transparent, right? But in both your practices, there's this kind of opacity where we're looking through different kinds of uh, lenses or different kinds of materials to get it uh, to arrive at uh, less predictable kinds of answers I think if I think about mm -hmm. the work that you're doing draping other artwork with the morning star motif um, we do have a couple of questions um, in the chat and I think we're uh, shifting towards um, engaging with some of those uh, and so I'm just they're also a little bit long so just leave, give me one second to catch up on uh, where one of the questions kind of ended up. Uh, one of them is, is thinking about thoughts of the word um, place keeping or place making. Oh, sorry. The person is proposing, does anyone have any thoughts on the word place keeping as a counter to the word place making? As in, well, there are many examples of place making activities that result in positive change. Some place making activities can also support gentrification, racism, real estate speculation, further colonialism, they say in brackets, all in the name of revitalization. And they go on to say, placekeeping reframes placemaking. Placekeeping is the act of care and maintenance of a place by, uh, with the people who live and work there. Um, and they go on to talk about uh, cultural memory associated with uh, space and place. Um, and there's a bit of a link here that I can't uh, engage in. But I think there's this question around, um, you know, there, there, I think there's this ongoing critique in public art, right, about how it can at times support gentrification or it can at times support kind of like the revitalization of an area, which often means like the poor people are pushed aside or something, right? And so uh, I think their, their question is around this, um, this naming and do you have any reaction to that proposal of place making versus place keeping? I would have um, actually one comment about that in relation and use my the the piece that I did settlement that's at Rodman Hall as an example of that uh, and it might be even more relevant um, today because of what's happened there uh, when I first put that piece in the garden uh, it was originally supposed to be a temporary piece so I put the the installed the branches and I did the garden and then I thought that was going to be it. But then Rodman Hall was interested, said we, they'd like to keep it. And then it became an, a permanent acquisition. But then there was the issue of, okay, we've got this garden there, um, which I had only intended the piece to be there the one season. That's got, I mean, the garden was a really important conceptual part of that whole piece. It's not just a badger and a coyote stuck out on the lawn somewhere. So the, um, a local uh, indigenous community group actually um, volunteered and said that they were really interested in maintaining that garden and coming back and, and planting that year after year. And I, I, I was really overwhelmed. I said, that's amazing. Um, but that's, it became, so in a small way, I, I think that that, um, not that all, all uh, you know, public artwork should be gardens or stuff, but that, that's way, one way that, um, different communities can come in and maintain that as a space for themselves. Um, 
uh, that goes through gen like different generations of children, adults, so forth like that. Now, re so that piece was put in, well, around 2012, so about uh, seven, eight years ago. And recently, Rodman Hall, there, there's been issues with uh, Brock University. So Brock University owns or does own Rodman Hall. Rodman Hall has just been sold. So that whole collection is going to go to some other artist's center. That's, uh, I guess, uh, they've been planning this for a while. Um, but that actual Rodman Hall itself has been sold to a developer. So this is what I'm trying to actually just today, I've been trying to find out what is going to happen to my piece because I didn't want it to, I, 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 I don't trust that a developer is going to come in and want to maintain the integrity of that piece, like with the garden and all this kind of thing. I did not intend that piece to be as some kind of um, ornamentation for a new multi-use residential development. Um, so this is some, I'll, I'll just say that this is something that has just popped up in my life as far and, and, and is on my radar um, as far as how, what kind of interventions are we doing in the public space and how do we maintain the integrity of that going forward? Um, I don't know, live forever? That's a, that's a really good point. I mean, the other thing is as artists, we're often instrumentalized by institutions. And so mm. trying to resist that. Um, the, the terms placekeeping and placemaking for me are incredibly loaded. Um, and I would, I'm hesitant to, um, I would probably stay away from those primarily because for me, it, it really points back to this idea of indigenous knowledge and knowledge keepers and knowledge carriers. So unless you're working directly with them and talking about the relationship that the institution has with those communities and with those people, um, I would probably, um, yeah, I, I kind of question that. Uh, I think the way that Jason and I have been looking at the work we do is really about um, making space, try not to take up too much space, um, calling in our often our, you know, our peers, um, expanding that, um, holding each other up, uh, all of those things. Yeah. Hey, thank you for your, for your thoughts there. Um, Jason, did you? Okay. Um, I do have a, another question here in the chat um, for, for Marianne. Uh, it's in your research for historical inhabitants and land use, what institutions are you, are you partnering with, if you are, um, in drawing or gathering some of your information, some of your research? Uh, and then they just say like libraries, natural history museums, indigenous organiza organizations, personal or family documents. Um, that's wondering where you are looking at, what kinds of sources you're looking at when you're researching maybe some site specificity uh, of an area. I would say all, all of those, but in addition, I, fi I find it's really important to in addition to all the research which one can gather through the different archives and stuff, it's really important to also, um, I just briefly touched on it earlier, um, but uh, access local indigenous knowledge holders, people actually from different, um, different generations. Uh, it can be elders, but it can be younger people, people who have experience of that space that this is their home community. Um, and uh, while my home community is, is in one area, I, I think it's really, or for myself, really important to, it goes to what I said about respecting who is there, um, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, but I go, the, the thing that I, I guess I give privilege in a way to is, um, well, privilege is the, the land that's there to begin with, but then the, 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 the people that have been there for a long, for, for like, from since the glaciers first left this. Not that there's people that are that old, sorry. I didn't mean to make it sound like that. But um, because otherwise it would, uh, you know, I, you can go and read things in a book, but to have someone's firsthand experience of, what, of their lived um, association with that land and with things that happened, there's, there's no way that I can get that from a book. And I think that for me, if I'm going into like with the Edmonton or something like that, uh, that that would be one example. I go and I do reach out to uh, local local knowledge holders, indigenous knowledge holders in the area. Um, so that's one thing. 
if I think of more, I'll, I'll jump in. That sounds great. Maybe um, an extension of that question, Maria and Jason, in your kind of thinking about site for this particular work, um, you mentioned sort of the physicality of site. Uh, is there other kinds of uh, ways in which you thought about um, this, the development of this work uh, as particular to this location? At the Varley Art Gallery in the courtyard? If not, that's okay. <laughs> Yeah, we, we really we really did not want to have, we really put a lot of emphasis on trying to accommodate its mixed use nature um, rather than come in and just kind of pow, you know, be the, be the classic Western artist where you come in, you know, this is no longer accessible because of my creation. Um, we really try to integrate our aesthetics and our concepts and our ideas into an environment uh, naturally as best we can. I mean, this is an urban environment. There's structures all around us. So it's not like we really have to, we try to just reflect, I mean, we try to reflect that sensibility. Um, and in doing so though, just kind of reorient things so that people, what was originally, I mean, you saw the image, what was originally a no man's land, pardon my French, right? Cause I know the barley is listening. But what is, you know, very underused, underserved, except in very specific circumstances for, the, for these festivals that happen periodically in the summer um, would be more inviting during the time that this, this place is here, but also be, um, uh, and these are just renderings. So we're still working out some of the, uh, some of the things like we're, I think originally we're a series of ramps, like a rotunda, not like a mini Guggenheim museum, but something so that uh, other people could get get, get into it. Um, we'll see. Maria? Yeah. We're thinking a lot about accessibility, those sorts of things. Um, you know, yeah, accessibility that for all folks. Um, and it also really, it's no different from other projects we've done. So often we, you know, we don't like to compete for projects our proposals will put something in and it's very every time it's kind of like a one-off or a site-specific um, project that's really meant for that particular moment and that's also part of the energy of Native Art Department International as well is that we get really excited about doing something that's um, you know a, a custom um, iteration that we've designed and worked around these parameters and that allows us to really think through things like well, yeah, who are these people? What are they about? What do they do? Is this something we, we want to be a part of? Um, so we're really selective about that. And, um, you know, who are we in conversation with? And I think because, you know, living in New York for so long, we love people and we're so used to being in a very diverse city that um, it's really exciting for us to get to know Toronto and parts of Toronto through our projects as we take them on. I just remembered something. Um, so one of the things, one, Marianne, I was thinking about the piece I saw at Wave Hill, where you had um, uh, a tablecloth being ripped off of with a bunch of dishes on there. Because we were actually in that exhibition. Oh, yeah. we, Maria, myself, and you were all in that show. Yes, I remember uh, that. And I was thinking about, when you was looking at your slide, what I really enjoyed is just how approachable your artwork and your sculptures are, uh, because they work at a one-to-one -one human scale. And our artworks operate the same way, right? Your beavers mm. aren't too big. Your beavers are beaver size. That's right. So to speak. <laughs> <laughs> the artwork that I've seen of yours operates on a human scale. And I think that's really important. And that's what makes it so approachable in terms of um, those kinds of elements. And Maria and I operate in the same way. Uh, we don't have oversized monumental things or anything that are too small. We like the one-to-one -one scale. I think, yeah, I, I, Thanks for saying that. <laughs> and I do remember that was so, Wave Hill was, was, was great. Um, but they, I, I think it is, I think that whole idea of scale is a really important, like if there's a reason for it to be gigantic, um, but with, uh, with my work often as I, um, as Tanya noted that I, there's never, there's rarely any um, people in, in my work, but the characters that are in it, people have, they're loaded as far as everyone's got an opinion about beavers and at, at least, we're, and, 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 or wolves or whatever. And, and that's why I put them in there because I think it's really important, especially in an 
increasingly urban environment where, where, where people have no experience with some of these animals to come across them as opposed to just having a really static, like just something stand, completely static standing there, that most of my animals are animated into some sort of expression. Um, so I want people to think about them in that way. Mind you, my, the, one of the, my biggest axes that I grind is that, you know, real estate developers will sell their properties or whatever as being close to nature or whatever, but God help it if, if nature ever en encroaches upon people's back backyards. Um, it's, it's this weird kind of um, relationship that a lot of people have come into now with things that are natural. So I, I think I'm digressing, but all to say that, yes, I, 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 I like to keep the scale where, where although people aren't in my installations, people are in them by virtue of their absence. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And we saw the ways the uh, public will readily engage as well with your work. Um, oh, they engage with it and they leap on it and they abuse it. And that's, but that's why you work with, I work with bronze because there's, there's not a whole heck of a lot you can do to bronze, you know, even, Cars can hit bronze and the bronze will be okay and the car will not. Well, thank you all. I do have a, a few other just um, kind of uh, comments. Um, oh, somebody said, tell us about the wax, <laughs> which I'm not sure exactly what that was referring to. Oh, the wax for uh, maybe in your process for the bronze? Probably. I'm not sure what they would want to say. They'd have to elaborate a bit more. Okay, okay we're going to pass that one. <laughs> um, so uh, there was some um, further thought and comment around kind of accessibility. So accessibility maybe in this one-to-one -one scale, accessibility as you, um, as you get further to thinking about your project and thinking about access. Uh, and is there, is there anything you want to comment on that impacts how you consider a project uh, based on those two things, on accessibility or, um, you know, uh, accessibility physically or accessibility in terms of content um, of the work? And also people are just interested that you are considering this in your practice. Ooh. Do you guys want to have a go at that? Yeah, we normally do. I mean, I, I have a really long um, museum, now retired, but museum uh, career. And oftentimes, operationally, we do have to, in the United States, we had ADA guidelines. And that I really emphasize, especially when Maria and I are putting together indoor installations and we're building structures, you know, there's a certain uh, dimensions, for example, wheelchair. I'm, I'm being very literal with your accessibility question here, but it's something that we are you know, we think about because oftentimes when we think about difference, we think about visual, a visual difference, color of person's skin, their appearance, those kinds of things. But there are other elements that I think get missed. Um, and often different, different um, abilities are one of those things that people don't think about. But I've noticed that plagues a lot of outdoor, outdoor public art um, that are supposed to be gathering points. Um, and also in terms of visualities being at a certain height, and those kinds of things. So we do keep that in mind. It's a habit now. In fact, it's become so internalized that I don't, I often omit even mentioning it until someone brings it up. Yeah, well, I think, oh, go ahead, Marianne. Oh, I, I was going to just springboard off of that was that it's um, access, like physical accessibility um, to the work has been on my radar for a long time. Um, because of an experience I had with uh, one of my, uh, well, actually right from the beginning with some of my early public artworks. And as I was there, um, you know, doing the installation day after day as the different components were coming together for the work. Um, at one point, there was uh, this one particular piece in Peterborough there. It had just been in this field that was kind of an industrial wasteland and they were building it into something that, you know, like a walkway. And as soon as there was a walkway in, these people, um, these older people that were in, uh, some of them were in wheelchairs and others were pushing them along the new walkway that enabled them to get to the piece. And they said, oh, we live in a senior's residence across and we've been watching you for the past couple of weeks while you were doing the installation. And we're so glad that we can come and actually interact and see, to see the piece and touch it and do things. So I think that there's all these different, um, it, aspects to the work that all of us do as far as physically like not just the concept you know we put all this work into the conceptual um framework that supports the work but also uh people who have different 
um, uh, abilities or physical le uh, limitations, whether it's movement or sight or all these things, that our work can be experienced by them as well. And that it's like, this work has to be experienced by everybody. It's not just meant for a narrow few. Um, yeah, so I don't know, just to elaborate on what Jason was saying. So, so yeah. there's another part about accessibility though, where I think I'm hearing it used, especially now in COVID times, in terms of remote viewing or remote mm. experiences. And that's something Thing that you know you can create a situation that is disputable and I think this is where Maria I don't, don't want to overstep here but this is where I think we operate we move into that territory because we really I firmly believe I'm not going to speak for my wife just yet mm -hmm. I firmly believe that the Native Art Department installations artworks are best experienced in person and not virtually and that they reward the in-person experience over the post internet approach um, first and foremost and that is part of the entirety of the creation and conceptual process. Yeah, and I think as you're mentioning, it's your, you know, we're, we're all repositioning how we think about this kind of um, accessibility as, as you refer to in terms of the digital or the virtual and we're here in this, you know, virtual conversation, which in some ways uh, makes some kinds of accessibility and in other ways, you know, creates uh, other challenges. Um, and of course, then also there's how much of that is the artist's responsibility, how much of that is the institution and their responsibilities in making those kinds of spaces um, considered and developing partnerships. And I'm struck by uh, Marianne, how it was an Indigenous group that came forward that wanted to take care of the garden, whereas maybe there was no plan from the um, directly from the institution. So thank you both for your for your presentations. I think they gave us such a um, such an in, like such a insightful and uh, a, a kind of a decentered view. So a kind of a, a positionality that allows us to consider other elements and to think about destabilizing some of the conventions perhaps of public art by this idea of inviting uh, gathering, which I know is a complicated word right now, but inviting um, gathering, inviting unlikely partnerships, uh, you know, thinking about coyote and badger, thinking about the twinning of the gazebo and all these things. So I, I know that we're um, moving into some sum up. So thank you all though. I'm really honored to be in conversation with, with all of you and have the utmost respect for your practices. And I'm so excited to see this work um, come to fruition, Maria and Jason. Thanks, Tanya. And thank, uh, thank you, you, Tanya, for your uh, candid and dynamic steering of the conversation. Thanks again to Jason, Maria, and Marianne for your work and for sharing your work with our audience. Um, in my opening remarks, uh, I introduced our interest in setting up a conversation about placemaking as one in which we are thinking about who public art and public space and place is for, um, and, and by extension, who is responsible for its care and the philosophies behind ownership versus and or stewardship. And so um, I've really appreciated the comment about placemaking versus placekeeping, as well as Maria's response about those both being loaded terms and the importance of Indigenous knowledge and Indigenous knowledge holders um, in thinking about placekeeping, uh, meaning kind of translating to stewardship and thinking about responsibility for past, present, and future. Um, I also echo Tanya, you know, thinking about Tanya's reflecting on Marianne's uh, uh, anecdote about the coyote and the badger working together and that uh, resonating with what Jason and Maria talked about, the double gazebo, as a structure that is not combined but is intersected and, uh, and sort of codependent that you cannot destroy uh, one without destroying the other. Um, you cannot protect one and, and not the other. Um, and so, and also your use of reflective materials and surfaces and talking about relationality. So there's so much to think about there. And I, you know, in your last comment, I hope that we do all get to experience this more in real life again, because that is kind of what it's all about is drawing people out into real place, not this internet place, as much as it's great exploring you know, who we can speak to virtually. So thank you all. Uh, thank you to our audience for joining us. Um, before I hand over to Yan for final remarks, please mark your calendars for our future events. Next week, we have November 24th, 1.30 p.m. EST. Uh, we have a session, session seven? Is it session seven already? Uh, site specificity and public art featuring artists Maggie Grote and Paul Wong, as well as Randy Neeson, uh, who's with the public art program at the city of Calgary. Uh, and worked closely with the new gallery on the Chinatown Artist Residency uh, in Calgary. 
And that conversation is moderated by uh, artist Annie Wong. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, thanks again, everyone, and for this wonderful and insightful session. And uh, thanks for the, all the audience uh, joining us today and hope to see you again in the next three sessions. And as mentioned, all the sessions will be recorded and make available online at the summit website. The recordings of the last five sessions are all available now. Everyone who signs up for our live sessions will also receive our biweekly newsletters in which you will find all summer summit related updates and a series of commission interviews and please stay tuned for the native art department internationals commission at the valley art gallery's courtyard in the new year the piece will be situated in proximity with marion barkhouse's quarry at uh, two good pond park it's very interesting to think now and how to activate the piece as we heard and Jason and Maria talked about it, the happenings and activities and events around it and what's happening there, the gatherings as equally important as the structure. So how can we do that now in response to this new social protocol around us? So hopefully by the time spring comes upon us, we can visit both projects and uh, in Markham. And that's it for today's session. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the day. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs> Thank you.